Hey everyone, Coach Lori here with another session of Conversations with Courageous Cancer Warriors. And today we have an amazing guest um, that I am so thrilled to hear her warrior story. Um, Nancy McKay is a stage 1C ovarian cancer warrior. She's also the founder of Amazing Outlook Coaching, a speaker, an author, and a uh, puppy rescuer. She has two Westies, Maggie and Tommy, that I can't wait to talk about. Um, Nancy, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity, Lori. So I am, um, I am really intrigued by your story because catching ovarian cancer early is really um, an outlier and not the, accept and not the norm, right? So you wanna tell us a little bit about your journey? Sure. Um, so mid-November of 2014, uh, I woke up one morning and got out of the shower and doubled over in pain. Oof. And uh, my husband had made us chili for dinner the night before, so I was tempted to blame it on the chili. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I thought I was having an appendicitis attack. I mean, it was stabbing pain, really severe. Um, went and laid down on the bed and... Um, hoped that it would pass. And, you know, it wasn't getting much better. So uh, we decided we better go to the ER. And we were having a really good snowstorm. Um, and so it was like, oh, God, you know, I was just so, I was scared, but I was also like, you know, this is too much trouble. <laughs> Yeah. And so we're, you know, halfway to the ER and I'm, and it, the pain is starting to subside a little. And I thought, oh, you know, I bet I'm just making a mountain out of a molehill. Maybe we should turn around and go home. And for those <laughs> listening, you know, you live in Colorado. So when you right. mean a snowstorm, you mean a snowstorm. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, not it like was, a flurry. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was coming down pretty good and the roads were getting bad and so on and so forth. And, and um, so my husband said, well, we're almost there. Let's just keep going. So got there and, uh, I was very well attended to and, but this was a small, um, sort of satellite ER, not like the hospital ER. And so they didn't have an ultrasound, um, there. They had to bring in a technician, uh, kind of a mobile technician person. So, you know, they gave me some pain relievers and uh, we had to wait for the, the ultrasound gal to come. And uh, so they did that. And the doctor said, well, it looks like you have a fibroid on your right ovary. And I'd never been told I had fibroids or had any problem. I was pretty textbook. And um, he said, he handed me a disc, you know, like a CD disc and uh, a paper report. And he said, I want you to call your uh, OBGYN and schedule an appointment with her as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So uh, went home, this was, you know, a few hours later, went home and my husband goes off to work and I pick up the phone and call my doctor and and actually I think I had tried to use the patient portal because I had been told that that's the best way to get a hold of them and you know I, I wasn't getting anywhere with that and so I called and um, left a message for the PA and didn't hear didn't hear and now I'm starting to get a little uptight <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah as we all do yes absolutely <laughs> and so I started getting a little bit more persistent in my uh, leaving messages. And finally, she called me back that afternoon. She was a little put out that I had been so persistent. And she was able to get me in the next day for a visit with the doctor. So, so I get to the doctor's office the next day. And she quite put out that I was so persistent. And pretty condescending and she she couldn't uh they didn't have the software to read the disc 
that the doctor at the ER had given me. And she said very condescendingly, Nancy, fibroids rarely turn to cancer. But if it makes you feel any better, we'll do a follow-up ultrasound. Uh, and so it was November. So, you know, the first of the year. Well, if I had had my wits about me, I would have said, let's schedule a follow-up ultrasound today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But I didn't. And so I went back January 2nd and had an ultrasound. And she called me. Um, that was on a Wednesday. She called me on Monday and said, I'm sorry to let you know, but you have a mass on your right ovary. And I'm referring you to a, a gynecologic oncologist because I no longer do surgery. I just have to stop you right there because I am so mad for you because first and foremost, the physician you originally saw said, hey, you have something going on. Mm -hmm. And then this other physician is like, oh no, you're being, you're just. You're being an alarmist. Yeah. It's, and why would they do that? That makes me so angry. So, um, and for those people who are listening, actual fibroids are very rare on the ovaries themselves. They happen within the uterus, but they don't, there's a completely different fibrotic mass that happens on ovaries. So if anybody's listening, if somebody tells you that, be like Nancy and be persistent. Keep going and go and get seen. All right. And I, so didn't, you, I didn't know that. So yeah. that's good to know. There are different, yeah. there are different tumor types, but fibroids themselves do not originate in an ovary because it comes from the muscle lining of the uterus, right? And so the ovary is a completely different organ. Um, so kind of just keep that in mind, folks, like make sure you, you stay persistent. And I'm so happy you went back for that ultrasound. Oh, me too. And you did. Because, because then the pain went away mm -hmm. and I had no further symptoms. When I went in for that second ultrasound, I was so asymptomatic. I mean, it was like, okay, this probably is really overkill, you know? So, and, so did they tell you that it was like a cystic mass and one of the cysts ruptured or did they ever say where the pain came from? Well, I think the came, pain came from that fibroid. I think it shifted somehow. Okay. And um, because I, you know, it was the size of a tennis ball or an mm -hmm. orange when they removed it, evidently. Mm. And, um, you know, I had never had any pain up to that point. Right. And after that day, I never had any pain again. Yeah. And, and so it was like, um, if I hadn't been persistent, mm -hmm. then I would have ultimately been diagnosed as, you know, uh, three C or four. Or yeah. A, a more advanced stage. And the yeah. thing too, is that, you know, you bring up a, a valid point that most of the time people will not feel any symptoms right. until, you know, your cancer is pretty far removed, which is why early detection is you know, key, or I mean, further along, which is why early detection right. is key. And especially with ovarian cancer, like, right. you know, it, it's, it, somebody was definitely looking out for you. I mean, oh, definitely, definitely. Wow. Because, you know, I had had lower back pain and I blamed it on our mattress. Mm -hmm. um, that's a sign. That's a symptom. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I was peeing more frequently, which is a also a sign. Mm -hmm. I, and I chalked that up to menopause. Yeah, but and we do so, you know, everything was, you know, could be associated with something else. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? And I wasn't having the bloating or feeling full after just eating a little bit, damn it. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> you know, I so I wasn't having any of those types of symptoms. So it right. wasn't um, you know, and at the time I didn't know what the symptoms were for ovarian cancer. So I didn't know to be aware of it. Right. Absolutely. And so then you were diagnosed in January on your ultrasound. Did you go right into surgery? Did they do a biopsy? How did that work for you? So, um, so my doctor referred me to this oncologist. It took, um, it took about 10 days to get in to see the oncologist. So it was about the 15th of January when I got in to see him and 
Uh, surgery was two weeks later on my 58th birthday. Hmm. And um, I woke up and he said, uh, you know, basically happy birthday, you have cancer. But you know, you have uh, early stage 1C and um, you know, he wouldn't, you know, there was no biopsy. They just did a full, yeah, full hysterectomy. Um, they did the pathology while I was still on the table, mm -hmm. which was great. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so he was, he was very, um, certain that he got everything and, um, great. you know, great. And then, uh, the next day he said, you know, we'll start you on chemo in two weeks. And I said, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Cause I was not going to, I was not going to do chemo. And yeah. then I changed my mind. But yeah. And so then you went through, you went through with it. I did go through with it. Yeah. But I had had a good friend die from chemo from reaction to chemo. Okay. And, uh, so I was, I was really scared about doing it. And my mom had had a, had a rough go and she had lung cancer and went through chemo. And, you know, I just, I'm kind of one of those, uh, the treatment is worth worse than the disease, especially in early, early stage ovarian mm -hmm. cancer. You know, I was just one letter up from not having to have chemo, you right. know, and it was more of an insurance policy really than a treatment. Right. And so, it was, it was kind of hard for me to uh, swallow that I yeah. was need to do that. But. And you're definitely conflicted trying to make that decision, oh, right? Oh, yeah. 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 And it's a big decision. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it is a big decision. So. And so how did you keep a positive mindset? Because that's like, first, first and foremost, you're like, wait a second. I was told this is like nothing, right? But even though you knew it was something. And then so you go through surgery, you, you, you then find you have to do chemo, which you do not want to do. Like, how did you handle all of those emotions? Well, you know, I prayed a lot mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and then it was, I guess I'm pretty pragmatic because it was just like, okay, well, this is what I have to do. So I'm going to do it. Yeah. And I've always had a positive outlook, even though I've been, diagnosed as clinically depressed, I've always had this po positive outlook, which is mm -hmm. why I named my company what I did. And, mm -hmm. and I just, there was something, I had an inner wisdom that knew I was going to be okay. Yeah. And I've always had that. I've always known that I was going to land on my feet, that everything was going to be okay. Um, It just, you know, it, that's just the way it was. And so, you know, I went to each chemo appointment with a smile on my face and I never had any horrible reaction. You know, I just had kind of the standard um, side effects, biggest one losing my hair. And otherwise I didn't have a whole lot of trouble. So it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't the worst thing that ever happened to me that I, by a long stretch so which I'm so thankful for because you were so concerned going in there rightfully yeah. so so for you to for you to have an easy time that's not uh, for you not to have any severe conditions where it would yeah. get your anxiety really going if, yeah right like you had to go through it and then at least and you know, it's kind of like that saying, you know, I, it's a terrible saying and I love it that way, but it was like, you, you were lucky, right? You were lucky that it wasn't that bad in a way oh, because it didn't get your emotional side. Exactly. Up. Exactly. Even though you I know, don't and, want you to have to go through it. Right. And, you know, and a lot of people would say, well, you didn't have any trouble. So it's easy for you to be positive, Ugh. right? You know, I wasn't sick as a dog and I know a lot of, a lot of people are. And yeah. it's hideous. Yeah. And um, touch wood. I think, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons why. Um, uh, I think mindset has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you think something is going to be 
hideous, then you make it hideous. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, um, and so that just wasn't part of my plan. You know, my plan was to, and, and not everything went according to plan. You know, like I had chemo on Wednesdays and I planned on going to work Thursday and Friday feeling like shit Saturday and Sunday and being back at work on Monday. Mm -hmm. Well, the other significant side effect I had was fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so uh, not only did I, I did the first round, I didn't want to go to work on Thursday because I wasn't sure if I'd get sick while I was at work. So I wanted to take the first one, kind of let's see what happens, <laughs> you know, and we'll go according to plan starting the second one. Well, mm -hmm. the, the first couple of days were fine. Um, I felt kind of nauseous, you know, and, and the stuff they gave me made it worse. Mm -hmm. And so, but then the, the, the fatigue set in over the weekend and it didn't let up for a whole week. So mm -hmm. every round I missed 10 days of work, you know, yeah. I didn't go on, on, you know, <laughs> Uh, at, to work on Monday, I went to work a week from Monday, sort of. Yeah. Thing. So it was, um, the fatigue was bad, but other than that, you know, it was pretty benign. And for most people, um, they really become, they have complications, become symptomatic with chemo, like week two, or especially by week three, like th that's when people really have a concern. So you know, I find it very interesting that your symptoms really just lasted the whole course, right? They were yeah. a little bit, you know, for the blessing that they were, that they weren't as debilitating as they could have been, even though they right. were, you know, uh, consider, you know, a consideration. Um, yeah, you just remained slow and steady, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I did. You know, um, so I, you know, I'd end up going back to work for a couple of weeks and then, you know, here we go again. Started and all over. You know, um, and so what was the thing that surprised you the most about going through all of this? As far as side effect wise go, or just, um, I think thing. one of the, well, the biggest thing was that my perspective on life began to change. Mm -hmm. How so? Um, well, you know, I had been working for a, a great company and, and they remained steadfast in their support for me. And, um, I felt incredibly guilty for miss, missing as much work as I did. And so I beat myself up. They didn't beat me up. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was, that was really interesting to see um, how I reacted to that. And I, <laughs> I wish that I had been a life coach when I went through this because I would have been able to do some self coaching around it. But, mm -hmm. um, but that's what, what ultimately started this change of perspective for me was I realized that the job that I had been hired, um, you know, I had for five years was starting to lose its um, shine. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, I wasn't getting, um, I was no longer being fulfilled by the work I was doing. And for me, that's a very important part of life is, yeah. you know, not just punching a clock. And, you know, I have to feel like what I'm doing makes a difference. Because you spend so much time working, right? right. Like we all do. It, we need right. to make it be right. something that we enjoy. Right. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I was making wonderful money and I was, you know, I had great benefits and I enjoyed the people that I worked with, but I wasn't enjoying the work I was doing. Yeah. And as time went on, after I finished chemo and life started getting back to normal a little bit, it was like, you know, something's just not right. And so, so what'd a couple, you do? Years, couple of years later, I started training to become a life coach. Great. Because I knew I needed to do something different. And I was 60. Yeah. You know, which um, is great. and I thought, you know, <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah. So you know, what, I, what do you do in your coaching? Like how, who's your, um, what do you focus on? 
I work with women who are facing major life challenges. So I'm also a recovering alcoholic. Okay. And so I, I kind of gravitate <laughs> to, to women who are over drinking and are um, struggling with alcohol, but also with cancer and, yeah. um, and just any kind of life challenge. You know, I use mindset so much in my coaching and everybody struggles with mindset. And yeah. so, you know, if, you know, one of my favorite um, quotes is pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. And we, we suffer so much from the thoughts that we think about our circumstances and our, you know, circumstances are neutral. Um, it's our thoughts about the circumstances that make, that make us suffer. And right. so um, that's what I work on mostly with, with my clients, whatever their struggle is. Oh, I love that. And how can people find you? Well, um, my email is nancy at amazingoutlookcoaching.com. And my company is amazingoutlookcoaching.com. Um, and it definitely suits you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And, you know, I'm really, I'm really happy you decided to take that drive on that snowy day, even when you didn't want to. I am right? too. I am too. And, and I continue to be cancer free and it's just, um, it. you know, I'm almost six years out. So it's, almost six years. Yeah. November, yep. 2014. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And for those listening, like, remember you need to be your own advocate and you need to definitely keep pushing forward. Um, and if you find that you need guidance, you know, there's people like Nancy and I that are definitely there to support you. So reach out at any time and um, we will definitely, you know, be, be the rock for you when you can't be one for yourself. Absolutely. I'd Nancy, also like to add that I'm a, a board member of the Colorado Ovarian Cancer Alliance and Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, it's a wonderful organization for Colorado residents that are um, having to deal with this horrible disease. And uh, ovarian cancer is a, you know, it, it's a bitch. So yeah, um, be aware of the symptoms and, um, you know, understand that a pap smear is not a diagnostic tool. <laughs> Not for ovarian cancer, Not right? For ovarian cancer. Yeah, and that's the thing that you bring up a valid point. Um, definitely make sure you get your your exams and make sure that they check your ovaries, right? So that's when absolutely it, it, it's the Pap smear is for your cervix. It's not for your ovaries. So make sure that you do that and um, you know be diligent about any any symptoms, especially as we go through life. We kind of you know as we age, we're kind of you know, oh, I, that was because I, I did X, Y, and Z. You know, if something is persistent and keeps coming back, then definitely make sure that you get it checked out. Be Absolutely. your own advocate and, and, yep. and make sure you, you do diligence, right? Go yep. and get your exams done. But um, yeah, thank you so much for that. We'll make sure that we add that to the, comp, to the um, as part of how can people find you. We'll, we'll make Wonderful. sure we add the the Alliance too. And so thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you sharing your story. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity.